That is the title of my sermon tonight. The title of my sermon is Repentance in the Bible. Now, I have preached on this topic before, just in various sermons, but I've never preached a sermon just dedicated to the topic of repentance. And I hope uh, this sermon helps you to understand this topic a lot better um, because there's a lot of false doctrine out there about repentance. There's a lot of confusion. So I'm hoping that this sermon tonight will help you will help get your head around all the verses in the Bible that uh, contain the word repentance. Now, we're not going to be going through every verse, but hopefully I've summarized it for you in a way where it helps. Now, in this sermon, I'm going to go over four points just to give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about. The first one is the accusation or the false accusation that people say about uh, believers like us who preach the gospel the way we do. The second one is the four types of repentance that we find in the Bible. You say, four types of repentance? I thought repentance meant one thing. Well, that's what we're going to talk about in the second point. Now, the third point is just two additional objections. I didn't know where to throw those, so I'm just throwing them at the end there. Some other comments that you might hear about this topic. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is why it's a big deal. Why it's a big deal. And if you are familiar with this topic, you'd already know why. But that's where I want to finish this sermon. So, first of all, let's talk about the false accusation that people make about the way we believe about the gospel. Now, what do we believe about the gospel? We believe that salvation is by grace through faith. That for somebody to, to be saved and have everlasting life, once saved, always saved, is that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ plus nothing, minus nothing. It's by grace through faith. And, it's, and we, we make the distinction between grace and works. We emphasize that distinction because that, the Bible emphasizes that distinction. Right? So we're not, we hearken on that separation of grace and works because the Bible is so clear that grace and works do not mix. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, these are the two most famous ones that we use, right? Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not. And I love Romans 4 because it's just so clear that it is not of works at all. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then verse 6 emphasizes it again. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So when people say, well, salvation, oh yeah, the salvation has works included, or salvation is by works, or if you're really saved, you're going to have works. The Bible says here in Romans 4, 5, no, you're saved apart from works, right? You're saved that when you work not, you are saved, you have imputed righteousness without works. You see how works is not part of the equation for salvation because salvation's by grace. And it's separated because you can't have the mixed. This is what Romans 11.6 is teaching us, that you cannot mix grace and works. Once you add a little bit of works into grace, it's not grace anymore. And once you add, you know, once something is work, it can't be grace anymore. This is what Romans 11.6 teaches. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So this is why somebody can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do absolutely no works at all. So what you see from them, you don't see necessarily the spiritual change that's taken place because that's invisible. But you may see the exact same person. The only thing that would have changed is their faith. And they can have no works because works is not part of the equation for salvation because salvation is by grace, right? So what, the, what works the person did before, what works the person did during, or what works the person did after salvation is completely irrelevant. Think about it this way. If you were given something for free, why would I ask you the question, well, how much did you pay for it? What did it cost? Well, it was never part of the equation. So asking how much it cost or how much you paid for it when you received it or how much you owe once you receive it is completely irrelevant to something that you receive for free. And if you had to pay for it, like it's saying here, if you had to work for something, Romans 4, 5, it's the reward reckoned of, you know, of debt. 
you know, not of grace, right? So, that's what we believe about salvation. Now, what people will say when we emphasize, hey, it's just by grace through faith and no works included, that means somebody can believe, be saved forever, not do any works at all, they die and they will be in heaven, right? That's what we mean by that. And this is what people falsely accuse us of, that what they'll say is, you are removing repentance from the gospel. That's what they'll say. They're saying, you do not... They say, you are removing repentance from the gospel. Now, here's the first point. If what they mean by repentance is simply that you need to acknowledge that you're a sinner, well, then I would agree with their position. I would just disagree with the wording that they're using. Right? Because if somebody says, well, you, you need to repent of sin, and that what they just mean by that is you just need to acknowledge that you are a sinner worthy of hell, well, then I agree with what they mean. I just wouldn't use those words because from the Bible, that's not what those words mean. But I agree with what they're saying. Yes, yeah, somebody does have to acknowledge that they have sinned, that their sin makes them deserving of hell, that without Jesus Christ, they would spend an eternity of hell, and that's the reason why they need to believe on Jesus Christ. But they, do they need to repent of sin in the sense of turn from sin or be willing to turn from sin? No. And when we make that point, people will say, well, you're removing repentance from the gospel. Now, let me ask you, we, may, we preach the gospel and when we go out and preach salvation by grace, we don't always use the word repent. And this is why people say, oh, you're removing repentance from the gospel. How can you preach the gospel without using the word repent? But did you know, I don't know if you know this, but in the Bible... In the, in the Gospel of John, do you know that the word repent, repenting, repentance does not even appear once? Not even one time in the Gospel of John. I don't know if you, if you realize that. And you know, the Gospel of John, if you read at John 20, verse 30, look at what it says, what, what John wrote about the Gospel of John. He says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Right? So he's saying, I didn't write all the miracles that Jesus did in this book, the Gospel of John. But then he says, this is the second last chapter of John, right? But these are written, so I'm, this is the reason why I'm writing these miracles in the Gospel of John. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So the one gospel that says, hey, this is the reason why I'm writing this book, I'm writing this gospel, is so that you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and the word repent doesn't even appear once. Now let me ask you, did John remove repentance from the gospel? You know, is John not preaching biblical repentance because he didn't use the word? No, it's because they're misunderstanding what repentance is when it comes, when it comes to the gospel which is salvation by grace through faith. So it's interesting that the one gospel that is written that you might believe doesn't have that word. So if we preach the gospel not necessarily using the word repent, does that mean we're removing biblical repentance for salvation from the gospel? No. Now I understand people have a concern. This is where this, this uh, the, if, you, if you're wondering what the motivation is behind somebody that is preaching, you got to preach repentance, brother. you got to preach repentance. Sins. I understand their concern because you know what they're concerned about? It's the same thing I'm concerned about. It's the same thing I don't like. Is, is we don't like people that profess to be Christians, whether they're saved or not saved, right? When we're talking about mainly uh, whether they're saved or unsaved. Pe people who profess to be Christians but aren't living a Christ-like life. I mean, no, every Christian doesn't like that. Nobody likes somebody who professes Jesus Christ as their saviour, says they're a Christian, but doesn't live as they ought as a Christian. And that's where I understand their concern. I understand that that is, that is a problem. But is the solution to change the gospel and add works to the gospel and add repentance of sins to salvation? Or is the solution to preach more repentance of sins to believers? so that they will turn from their sins, right? And they will get the sin out of their life. Like you guys hear me preach here, hey, there's certain sins, materialism, greediness, laziness, 
all these sorts of things. You know, wives not submitting to their husbands, husbands not leading. This is the sort of repentance of sins that believers should be doing, but you don't do that to be saved. Salvation is by grace through faith. So we need to emphasize repentance of sin in the Christian life, not add repentance of sins to the gospel and change the gospel message into heresy. Work salvation is heresy because if somebody believes work salvation, they will not be saved. Now, does that mean somebody who is saved can preach work salvation? It's possible, right? It's possible for somebody to be mixed up, who's saved, mixed up on repentance and be believing work salvation. But the people that are hearing their message are not going to get saved hearing turn from your sins to be saved because if they believe that, they're not saved yet. They need to completely trust Jesus Christ. Now, did John the Baptist and Jesus and the apostles, did they preach repentance? Yeah, they did. There's no argument there. So we're, our position is not even that we don't believe in repentance. Right? We believe in repentance. The question is, what do you mean by repentance? You know, I had somebody recently ask me, you know, what, they asked me, what do you think when you hear the word repentance? And this is what inspired the sermon. Um, because, you know, they try and put you into a box to say, hey, repentance can only mean one thing in the Bible, but it doesn't. You know, repentance does mean one thing, but there are multiple things that can be repented of, and that's what this sermon is about. So, yes, we believe in repentance. Yes, we believe in repentance of sin, but this is not the only repentance that's in the Bible. So, when we say, yeah, John the Baptist preached repentance, Jesus preached repentance, Paul re preached repentance. Peter preached repentance. The question is not, did they preach repentance? The question is, what did they mean when they preached repentance? Do they mean what they are talking about? So what I did for this sermon, and we're going on to the next point now, is we're going to look at four types of repentance. And you say, well, you know, I thought repentance only ever meant one thing in the Bible. Well, that's why we're, we're looking at it. So what I did is I typed in to Sword Searcher, which is the program that I use, any combination of repent, repented, repented, repenting, repentist, repenteth, repentance, just any time the word repentance happens in the Bible, and I've summarized them for you guys to help you get your head around them into four different types of repentance. So we're not going to go through every passage, but I'll give you a few examples of each one. All right. Now, the first one is repentance from evil. Repentance from evil. Now, this is not repentance from sin because not all evil is sin, and I'll explain why. Let's go to Jonah 3. This is the best example, and I'm, st I'm starting off with one of the best counter-arguments to this repent of your sins heresy because Jonah 3 just seems to have it all in there. Well, let's look at Jonah 3. So this is the story of Jonah going to Nineveh. And he was preaching that they needed to repent of their sins, right? Because this was the old covenant, right? Where you had to obey to be blessed, or, or and if you disobey, you were cursed. And that's why we see this message in the Old Testament of turning from sin in order to receive God's mercy. Now, I think God only was ever merciful to them because of grace, because nobody ever does completely turn from their own sins. But we see a picture of this old covenant. But Jonah 3, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the, to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with, uh, covered, covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. So I haven't included the first part of the chapter here, but this is when Jonah goes into the heart of Nineveh and says, you know, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way. So this is what the king of Nineveh is saying, right, to everyone, saying, hey, put on sackcloth, humble yourself, and repent of your sins. Rep turn away from your evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. But look at this. Who can tell, look at this, if God will turn 
and repent. So wait a second, God here is repenting. So if, rep if, if they take the position that repentance always by default means repenting from sin, that's not possible because God doesn't have any sin to repent of. So what is he repenting of here? He's not repenting of sin because he doesn't have any sin. So this, this alone and these other passages, which there are 23 of that I counted, these passages prove that repentance, the word repentance in and of itself, cannot mean to turn from sin because that means God cannot repent. So what does repent mean? Repent means to change, right? To change your mind, to turn from something. But the question is, what are you turning from? And that's what the context of the passage explains. So the people here are turning from sin because they're turning from their evil way. But what is God turning from? God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. Now look at what it says in Jonah 3.10. And God saw their works. Now we should just be able to close up shop right now and just prove that if somebody says you need to repent of sin or turn from sins to be saved is blatantly teaching a work salvation and the bible here actually uses the word and defines the word and says hey look god saw their works that they turned from their evil way so the fact that they humbled themselves and put on sackcloth and said hey everyone turn from your evil way turn from your sins the bible says god saw those works so if you had to do that in order to be saved that's just blatant work salvation that they turn from their evil way look at this and god repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not so evil is not always sin. Evil can be sin, right? Because the evil and violent way of the Ninevites was sinful. They needed to turn from that. But when God repented of the evil that he was going to do unto them, evil sometimes just means you're harming somebody. Right? Like if somebody's worthy of death, like capital punishment is evil on that criminal. But it's not sinful, right? It's righteous evil like with god when he judged nations in the past and he sent for example king saul to go wipe out the amalekites or the canaanites this is evil that is done but when nineveh repented of their sin in this situation god spared them from the evil that he said he would do unto them so that's one type of repentance repenting from evil is not repenting of sin here's an example in jeremiah uh, 18 jeremiah 18 says here, and what, at what instant, this is God speaking, I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. So that's what he said to Nineveh, right? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. So that's the, that's the second example of the first type of repentance, which is repenting from evil. Now, what's a second type of repentance in the Bible? A second type is that you can actually repent from doing good. So you see how repentance is not always you're going to do something bad and then you, then you turn and do something good. Repentance is also if you intend on doing something good and then you repent from that and do something bad. And it's in this exact same passage in Jeremiah 18. We just keep reading. So we read 7 and 8. Now we read 9 and 10. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. So you remember before it was to pull down and to destroy it. See, so he was going to do evil. Now he's saying to this nation, hey, I'm actually going to do good for you. I'm going to build up, right, and plant it. If it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So you see how repentance in the Bible is not always turning from sin. We've got God repenting. We've got God repenting from evil. We've got God repenting from doing good as well. So you see how to repent just means that something changes, something you turn from something. But what are you turning from? Well, in this passage, the people are turning from sin. God is turning from evil, right? And he's also uh, turning from good in this passage. This is the first time repentance appears in the Bible, the word repent. This is Genesis 6. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart 
was only evil continually. So this is the reason why God sent a flood on the earth. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Now why have I categorized this as repenting from good? Because when he made man, remember he said, behold, it's very good. And he made man and he rested the seventh day and he said, behold, it's very good on the seventh day. But because man's heart was only evil continually, you know, after, you know, if you see Adam had sinned and you have a few generations passed, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So that's the second type of repentance. Now the second two I'm going to spend a bit more time on because this is really where the battle is, right? The third one we're going to talk about is repentance from sin. Repentance from sin. Now, is there repentance of sin in the Bible? Yes, there is. So nobody denies that there is repentance of sin in the Bible. The question is, is it related to salvation? Obviously our position is no, well, where do people get this idea? And I think they are misapplying Old Testament passages to New Testament scriptures. Or they are not distinguishing between New Testament scriptures that teach a turning from sin and New Testament scriptures that, that preach a turning from dead works or a turning from unbelief for salvation. Now, I want to prove to you from Ezekiel 18 that the phrase to turn from sin what that means is keep the commandments. Now, if somebody said to you, in order for you to be saved, you need to keep the commandments, what would you say? Heresy. Yeah. Work salvation. You know, is this guy even saved? Yeah. If that's what he's teaching, if that's what he's believing? But if somebody says, repent of your sin to be saved, now all of a sudden that's fine. That's not work salvation. But let me show you from Ezekiel 18 that the opposite of turning from sin, well, the same thing, another way to say keep the commandments is to turn from sin. These are one of the same thing because if, if you turn from a sin, you have to keep a commandment to turn from it. Think about lying. If I've been lying, how do I turn from that sin? Well, I need to stop lying, don't I? Now, if I stop lying, what commandment am I keeping? Thou shalt not lie. So you see, for me to turn from the sin of lying, I need to stop lying and keep that commandment to turn from it. And this is why it's so silly for them to say, well, you don't have to keep the commandments. You just need to turn from your sin. You're saying the exact same thing, just in a different way. Look at what it says in Ezekiel 18, reading for verse 21. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he had committed, look at this, and keep all my statutes. So you see how like in order to turn from all your sins, all your sins that you've committed, you need to keep God's statutes. And do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him in his righteousness that he hath done. So you see how the transgressions that you commit, when you turn from them, it's now the righteousness that you're doing. He shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Now, can you understand now why people mix up repentance in the New Testament? Because when you read this and you don't understand the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, you're thinking, hey, this is teaching that I have to turn from my sins to be saved. But no, because the New Testament is not a salvation by works, it's a salvation by grace. Just like we read in Jonah 3.10, turning from your sins is works. So if this is a teaching on salvation, then sign me up for Catholicism now because I may as well be a Catholic if I'm going to believe in work salvation. Let's continue. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness. So you see how you can turn away from doing good? We already talked about that. And committeth iniquity. So how do you turn away from doing good? You commit iniquity. How do you turn away from iniquity? You start doing good. You start doing right. And doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth. Shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. 
Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal, are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive, because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed. He shall surely live, he shall not die. So you see how the Old Testament covenant is turn away from your sins, keep the commandments and you'll live. Basically do works and you'll live. But that's the covenant that nobody could keep. That's why we're not saved by works and that's why we get the imputed righteousness of Christ through grace. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that's how we spiritually turn from our sins, right? Because now we are keeping the, we have the righteousness of Christ that has allowed us to keep this old covenant that is being taught here in Ezekiel 18. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Now this is a really familiar passage to those of you familiar with the repentance fight, because they always go to passages like this in the Old Testament. Everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent! Now what is the repentance being talked about in this passage? It's works. It's turning from your sins like the Ninevites did in Jonah 3. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so iniquity shall not be your ruin. So this is a passage exhorting them to do right, to do work. So I'm not going to use a passage like this for salvation because I don't want to teach a work salvation. And the people that are preaching repent of your sins using this passage I don't know if they realize this or they don't think it is work salvation, even though that's what's coming out of their mouth. Let's go to Matthew 12. Let's look at some New Testament passages now of turning from sin. Actual repentance in the Bible, but it's a repentance of sin. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and, ca and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So you see how when Jesus refers to Jonah 3 in Nineveh, Jesus actually says, hey, what they were doing was repentance. They were repenting from sin. They were turning from their evil way. And what is Jonah 3? What does God call it? Works. They repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Luke 17. This is where if you have a brother sin against you, right? And then they turn from that sin and you forgive them for it, right? Luke 17. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. So you see how he's turned from the trespass against his brother. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So again, this is repentance of sin in the Bible, but is this repentance in regards to salvation? This is not a passage about salvation. This is a passage about doing right and how you keep good relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ. So yes, is repentance of sin in the Bible? Yes. But where is it? It's applied to believers. It's not applied to salvation. We'll get to some other passages in a moment. Um, this is Revelation 3. I won't read through all of this for sake of time, but this is where you have the lukewarm church that's making God sick, and they think they're rich, and he's saying, hey, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve i feel like that's what i need my eyes feel so dry and you know it's so blind that thou mayest see as many as i love i rebuke and chase us. be zealous therefore and repent so you see how there's repentance in the bible here but who's being commanded to repent here a church a group of believers Believers are being commanded to repent of sin because that's the responsibility of a believer. And that's why when you come to church, you hear sermons about repenting of your sin. But when we go and preach the gospel to an unbeliever, we're not telling them to repent of their sins to be saved. Why? Because we're not teaching a work salvation. Acts 8. This is another uh, big example where people will use Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8 as an example of people having to turn from their sins 
in order to be saved. Now, when we read through Acts 8, it's very clear that Simon the sorcerer, when he was told to repent of the thought of his heart, he was already saved. Now, we go to Acts 8, verse 12. We see here the start of the story of Simon the sorcerer, where Philip goes down into this city to preach, and that's one of the cities where Simon the sorcerer has been bewitching people, right? basically tricking people with sorcery. And he says here, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So Philip is down there preaching the gospel, preaching the baptism of repentance we're going to talk about soon. People are believing it. People are getting baptized. Then it says in verse 13, then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered beholding the miracles. So you see how Simon the sorcerer, he gets saved in verse 13. He's now saved. He's baptized. He's even following Jesus Christ because he's continuing with Philip and beholding the things that are being done and the signs which were done. Now we jump down to verse 18. And this is now when the apostles come to lay hands on the believers to give them the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Now is Simon the sorcerer saved at this point? Yes. But he's asking for something wrong. He's trying to buy the power of the Holy Ghost with money. And this is what Peter is rebuking him for. Then he says in verse 22, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness. So is Peter telling him this is how to get saved? No, it's that he tried to buy the power of the Holy Ghost with money and that's what Peter is rebuking him for and telling him, no, turn from the, this thy wickedness and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Right? So, Because Peter doesn't know this guy. He's just come down to lay hands on these people you know, and, and, and give them the Holy Ghost. And he doesn't know Simon. He may not know that Simon's been following um, Philip and that he's saved already and he's already baptized. Then answered Simon, so Simon has the right response and said, yeah, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So this is one of the big examples that people use uh, that contains the word repentance. Because I'm only looking at passages that contain the word repentance. I could spend hours and hours going over passages that don't contain the word repentance where people use them to support this repentance of sins for salvation, heresy, just, you know, the parables and the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus and all these things. But we're just going to focus on the ones that contain the word repent. And Simon the sorcerer is one of them, where they say, see, Simon the sorcerer was told to repent of his sins. Yes, but he was already saved. He was a saved person being told to repent of his sins, not an unbeliever. This is a big one as well. This is 2 Corinthians 7, where Paul writes a letter. You know 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians was a letter to the Corinthians where Paul's rebuking them for a lot of things. You know, abusing the Lord's Supper, you know, men having long hair, not touching women, brothers and sisters in Christ suing one another, you know, not kicking people out of the church uh, for committing fornication. And this is what he's particularly addressing here because in 2 Corinthians 7, you find out that the Corinthian church did something about it. Right? And they actually listened to Paul. They actually repented of those sins. So how do we understand 2 Corinthians 7? I'll tell you how some people understand it and then I'll tell you how I understand this passage. For though I made you sorry with a letter, he's referring to 1 Corinthians, um, you know, making them sorrowful over the things that they had, were doing. And remember, he's, who's he writing to now? He's writing to believers. I do not repent, though I did repent. What is he saying here? He's saying, I, I don't regret, or I'm not, I didn't change my mind about writing you the first letter, but I did at one point change my mind. Right? That's what he's saying here. I mean, although I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. So now it's interesting here that this verse is actually Paul repenting of doing something good, right? to rebuke them and to correct them. He, he did repent of it, and then he decided, no, he didn't repent of it. He's, he's, he, he was glad he wrote that letter. 
I do not repent, though I did repent. So is this repentance here that Paul, did Paul repent of a sin here? No, he just repented of writing the letter. For I perceive that the same epistle, so epistle's just an older word for letter. And that's why when you think about the epistle of John, the epistle of Jude, if you didn't know what that word meant, that just means letter. Right? The epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. So he says, hey, you weren't just made sad. He's like, he's saying, I'm glad that I didn't write you this letter and you just got sad and didn't do anything about it. You actually got sad and you did something about it. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow, and this is really the main passage that I want to talk about that they try and use to say you need to repent of your sins to be saved. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now what do I think? This is what I think Paul is saying. Because some people will say here that this salvation here not necessarily mean, doesn't necessarily refer to a physical salvation. It's just referring to the fact that you will receive condemnation or, you know, remember in, um, in 1 Corinthians when we read about the Lord's Supper, people doing it unworthily, not discerning the Lord's body, people unsaved doing it as well, right? So when saved people do it unworthily, they're not discerning the Lord's body, they're not thinking about what this represents, there's some condemnation there. He says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So some people think that this godly sorrow worketh, working repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, is that you are being saved from chastisement or saved from condemnation from God as a believer, not the condemnation of hell. Now, I think verse 10 is actually talking about spiritual salvation, but this is how I understand what Paul is saying here. See, the context of this passage, what Paul is making a point of here is that there is a difference between the right type of sorrow and the wrong type of sorrow. And that's what he's commending them for. He says, hey, I'm happy not that you just were made sorrowful, having the wrong type of sorrow where nothing actually changes, but the right type of sorrow where something actually does change, right? And they actually got something right. Then he uses that same difference between godly sorrow and the sorrow of the world, which doesn't result in the right change or it has the wrong change, and applies it to salvation and says, hey, because the right type of sorrow can lead to somebody getting saved, right? And believing on Jesus Christ. Now, is that the only way somebody can get saved? Does somebody always have to have godly sorrow in order to get saved? Yeah, they need to admit they're a sinner. They need to admit that they deserve hell. But for some people, salvation is more, they, they, it's an intellectual decision. It's like, hey, that makes a lot of sense. I'm looking at the evidence and that, to, that makes me want to repent of my dead works, repent of unbelief and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But for some people, they've committed sins and they get a godly sorrow of it where it humbles them to then call out to Jesus to be saved because they realize they cannot save themselves. Now, I could say that, you know, everyone who gets saved has an element of godly sorrow because being, you know, admitting you're a sinner and admitting that you deserve hell, in a sense, is a type of godly sorrow if it leads you to call upon the Savior to be saved. But what is he saying here? What's the difference between godly sorrow and the sorrow of the world when it comes to salvation? Well, the sorrow of the world could be that their life, you know, maybe their life, they have sorrow where their life is just not together. And that's a wrong reason for people to get saved, right? Let's say somebody just thinks, well, my life sucks and, you know, maybe my business is not working. Hey, that's why I'm going to change, you know, what I believe and become a Christian. And then it doesn't work out. They weren't even saved to begin with. And then they get out, you know, or maybe think about the stony ground here where they, you know, none with joy receive it and they sprout up and then persecution happens when they don't have the godly sorrow that led them to the right type of repentance. So this is what I think he's talking about. He's comparing godly sorrow with sorrow of the world. What other types of sorrow of the, of the world are, are there? I mean, think about it. Like, what about depression? Where people become depressed and then they just don't do anything about it. They can't get themselves out of bed and you know, don't want to pick up their life. And That's sorrow that doesn't lead to salvation. Or what about somebody who's sorrowful over you know, not making it in life. And then they do make some change, but the right, the wrong type of change that doesn't save them. They, you know, they, they go and uh, watch a whole bunch of self-help seminars and they go and, you know, improve themselves. They become, they, they go and join a Buddhist club and they try and calm their spirit. 
So you see how this is not godly sorrow. This is just sorrow of the world working death. But godly sorrow that humbles yourself before God makes you realize you need a savior. That's the sort of sorrow that will lead to salvation, repentance to salvation where people don't repent of. But that's not the only way people get saved. So that's what I believe he's saying in verse 10. He's saying, hey, he's applying their situation and saying, hey, you guys didn't just have a sorrow of the world where you, know, you didn't change anything or did the wrong thing. You actually had the right type of sorrow that made you turn from this sin and get right. Just like with salvation, godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And then in verse 11, he goes back to their situation and says, for behold, this self-same thing, the same sort of godly sorrow that can lead somebody to repentance to salvation is the same sort of sorrow you had. And it says that you sorrowed after a godly sort. And it says, look at what it did to you in terms of you as a believer in your works, for what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now you might say, well, why isn't repentance there? Just repentance of sin. Because remember, repentance of sin is works. So why do we understand it that way? Or we, we say, well, maybe it's a physical salvation or it's referring to salvation because you can't interpret a passage in a way where you end up with work salvation. Because we already know work salvation is out of the question. So why then do we need to understand passages in light of the doctrine of salvation. That's the reason why. And some passages, I admit, are a little more difficult than others. But I don't think this one's that difficult. Like this one, I think, can fit quite easily into the correct doctrine of salvation. Let's look at one more passage in regards to this third type of repentance, which is repentance of sin. And this passage is really interesting because this is a passage of somebody who repented of their sin, and guess what? They weren't saved. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned. So he acknowledges that he sinned by betraying Jesus, and now he's turning from it. He's turning from his sins. And that I betrayed the innocent blood, and they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Right? So he repented of his sins. The sorrow of the world worketh death. Because when he hanged himself, guess where he was? He was burning in hell. Now let's look at the last one. We'll look at some passages there. So we've got repenting from evil. We've got repenting from good. We've got repentance from sin, which is taught in the Bible to believers. And the last one is the one about salvation, which is repenting from dead works. Let's go to Hebrews 6. This is where I get that point's title from. It says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. The principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now look here. The repentance that is about to be mentioned in Hebrews 6 is a fundamental of the faith. That's why it's a principle of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on, to, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now, one of the principles of the, uh, of the doctrine of Christ is it repentance of sin for salvation? No, it's repentance from dead works. Now, I've had somebody tell me, well, that's what sin is, it's dead works. No, 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 no. Dead works is not sin. What is dead works? Well, think about what a dead faith is. A dead faith is when you have faith without works. Now, what's cool about this, the Bible says, hey, what dead, you know what dead works are? Dead works is when you have works, but you don't have faith. And those are the people that are working their way to heaven, right? They are trying to work their way to heaven through baptism, through church attendance, through keeping the commandments, through turning over a new leaf, through giving their life to Jesus, through making Jesus the Lord of their life. They, are, they, are, they have dead works because they are believing on their works or they are, they are, they are tr they're doing works to save them without the faith on Jesus Christ. So you're not repenting from sin because nobody is trusting their sin to take them to heaven. 
right? The reason why it's dead works is because you're trusting those works will take you to heaven. People are going to church to try and get to heaven. People are praying to try and go to heaven. People are getting baptized to try and go to heaven. But nobody's fornicating to go to heaven. I'm going to fornicate my way to heaven. I'm going to take drugs to get myself to heaven. I'm going to murder as many people as I can to get to heaven. Now, I'm not trusting my sin to get me to heaven. That's why I'm not turning from my sin to believe on Jesus Christ. I'm turning from dead works. I'm turning from the works that if I trust them will send me to hell and putting my faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the fundamental principle of the doctrine of Christ that is being taught here. You turn from dead works and you have faith on God. That is salvation. So do we believe in a repentance? Yes, we believe in a repentance from dead works. And that's what we mean when we say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now let's go on to just look at some passages from John the Baptist and Jesus. Now, did they preach repent? Yes, they did. But the question is, what did they mean when they preached repentance? In those days came John the Baptist repeat, uh, preaching, I said re-preaching, repenting, preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I only realized this when I, when I was studying this out, but it's interesting that Jesus only starts preaching this message when John is in prison. Um, it says here in Matthew 4, 12, Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into the prison, he departed into Galilee. And I skipped down to verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So isn't that interesting that John the Baptist came preaching, you know, the baptism of repentance, is baptizing people he said hey i must decrease he must increase you know there's one coming after me and it's not until john is actually shut up in prison that then jesus steps in to start continuing that message i think that's interesting now what did they mean when they preached repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and this is where people disagree people will say that's there it is brother Repent of your sins to be saved. And we're saying, no, it's repentance from dead works. I already have Hebrews 6. Now, what's great about knowing about John and Jesus and Paul and Peter preaching the baptism of repentance, we don't have to guess what they mean by it. Did you know that? We don't have to guess what John the Baptist meant when he preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We don't have to guess when Jesus preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We don't have to guess what they mean. Why? because it's defined for us in the Bible. Paul in Acts 19 actually defines what John was preaching when he preached the baptism of repentance. And a lot of people that teach repent of your sins don't even know this passage is in there. So we don't even have to argue over what repentance is in regards to salvation, what the baptism of repentance is, because it says right here in Acts 19, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, so what was he preaching when he preached the baptism of repentance? That they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Does that sound familiar? Yep. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was the message of the baptism of the repentance. So the baptism of repentance, what was the message? Believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. So with that in mind, now we can think about going to Mark and compare that and say, oh, now we can make sense of Mark, why it says these passages. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Why? Because the baptism of repentance was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You will have your sins remitted. Look at what it says about Jesus preaching the baptism of repentance in Mark 1. And preached, saying, There cometh one after, oh, this is uh, John the Baptist still, after me, that latches of whose shoes I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. So you see he's talking about this one coming after him. This is Jesus now. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel so you see here it's not repent of your sins and believe the gospel it's repent 
from dead works and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the one preaching it. And this lines up with the principle of the doctrine of Christ. Remember the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God? That lines up with repent ye and believe the gospel. That's why we, we acknowledge there's a repentance. We believe in a repentance. It's just that we don't believe that repentance is turning from sin for salvation. The type of repentance for salvation is that you repent from dead works. You change what you believe and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to read some of these passages for you because I just think this preaching is so awesome. But here is Paul in Acts 13 preaching the baptism of repentance. And it's interesting because they reference John the Baptist. And look at what his message is. Let's read this together. And when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch to uh, Pis Pisgia, is that what it says? Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So they're going into, this is Paul now, he's gone into a synagogue and he's, and he's uh, listening to them talk. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So they've gone into the synagogue and the rulers said, Hey, men and brethren, if you've got something to preach, preach it. Then Paul stood up, beckoning with his hand and said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. I'm just going to read this sermon through, but this is so awesome, this sermon, when you hear how he summarizes everything. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high arm brought he them out of it, and about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of four hundred and fifty years until Samuel the prophet. So you see how he's giving us timeline of the history of Israel now. And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kis, King Saul a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed, who is that Jesus, right, the son of David? God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a saviour, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So you see how he lines up here, the Saviour coming, with this is what John the Baptist was preaching, that a Saviour was coming. And as John fulfilled his cause, he said, Who think ye that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Doesn't this sound familiar with Acts 19? That they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. So you see how he's preaching the gospel here now, the word of salvation? For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that, that, he, that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up from him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings. That's what the word gospel means, glad tidings. How that the promise that was made unto the fathers, God had fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he had raised up Jesus again. And it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And it's concerning that he raised him up from the dead. Now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So that's Jesus not staying in hell and his body not seeing corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Look at this, guys. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren. So you see how he's linking up the Saviour coming, the baptism of repentance. 
Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. The works, the dead works that you have to repent from and believe on Jesus Christ who justifies you from all things. Beware therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. What a powerful sermon. Acts 10. This is where Peter now is preaching the baptism of repentance, right? He's preaching the gospel. And this is where he... If you don't know the background in Acts 10, you know, this is where he gets the vision of all the unclean animals in the handkerchief and God tells him to eat the unclean animals. And he's saying, you know, I've never had an unclean animal come into my lips, right? Because he's a Jew. And God says, what I have cleansed, that call not unclean. Because what God is trying to show to him that salvation is not just for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles too. And this is where Cornelius, the Italian man, comes to Peter to hear words whereby thou and thy men shall be saved. He says uh, here in Acts 10, so this is when Peter now is preaching to the Gentiles, right, that come to him. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, Right, so this is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. He is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. So you see how he's saying, hey, this peace by Jesus Christ is what John's baptism was preaching, the baptism of repentance, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, but God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses, chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us, to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. Now look at this. This is what Peter is saying here in verse 43. This is what John the Baptist preached, the word of salvation that Paul referred to. And this is now what he is saying to the Gentiles. To him, Jesus Christ, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So he's saying, hey, that's what it was to us. That's what John the Baptist came preaching. And I want you guys to know that to him, give all the prophets witness. This is the repentance, the baptism of repentance, the repentance that the prophets were talking about. Here, in terms of salvation, to him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now Peter recounts, so that's the time when he's preaching to these Gentiles. And while he's preaching, they get saved. And then he recounts this story to Jews, because what happens is the Jews now get upset at him, saying, why did you go into men uncircumcised? Right? Because they still had a bit of a Judaizing way back then where they were separating themselves from each other, not realizing in the New Testament there is no Jew, there is no Greek anymore. Acts 11, he says, and I began to speak. So now he's recounting this story to them in Acts 10. In Acts 11, the story that happened in Acts 10, he says, and I, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water. So who is he referring to now? John the Baptist, the baptism of repentance. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. 
for as much then as God gave them. Look at this. The like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted, look at this, repentance unto life. So what did he grant to the Jews? Well, who had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, on the one coming after Jesus, Acts 19, right? Saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And that's what he's saying here. That's what happened to the Gentiles. And then what does he describe it as? God has also given to the Gentiles repentance unto life. You see, not repentance from sin, it's repentance from the dead works and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's one of the passages we always use when we go out soul winning. And that's what Peter is saying here in Acts 11. Who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And this is a very famous passage from 2 Peter 3 where it contains the word repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what is the repentance that he's talking about? Is he talking about turning from sin? No. It's the baptism of repentance, which is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What does that remind you of? John 3.16. Should not perish, but you believe, right? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So that's the repentance. He doesn't, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the repentance. Now, I want to tie it all together with Matthew 21. This is Jesus now preaching the baptism of repentance. Now, what's interesting about this passage in Matthew 21 is that Jesus actually ties together an example of somebody repenting from sin and then using it as an example of people not repenting from dead works. Look at this. And when he was coming to the temple... The chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? So Jesus is teaching and preaching, and they're saying, Whose authority do you come by to teach and preach these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Now, I don't know whether it's coincidence that Jesus used this reference, you know, maybe he had another reason to do it too, but I think it's interesting that this talks about repentance and he refers back to the baptism of John. It's probably because the baptism of John was the baptism of repentance, which is to believe on him, which should come after him, and they're not believing on Jesus Christ. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? So they know that the baptism of John came from the authority from heaven and he's trying to make them say it. Right? Because they're saying, hey, what authority are you doing these things by? And he's saying, hey, it's the same authority that John had when he came with the baptism of repentance. And they reasoned within themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. See, so they're not going to say that John wasn't sent of God because everybody knew that John was sent from God. And they answered Jesus, and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. When he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. So what's this parable here? He's saying there's two sons. The first son said, Hey, because the, the, the father is saying, hey, guys, go work in my vineyard. The first son says, all right, he says, uh, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go work in the vineyard. Then he changes his mind, and he does, right? So he goes from doing the wrong thing to doing the right thing. And he came to the second and said, likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. So what's the exact? The second son is saying he's going to go, but now he's repenting of good. 
Right? Remember how we talked about repenting of sin? He's repenting of good because he was going to do good and he repented from that and then he did the wrong thing. He didn't go. Verse 31, Jesus says, Whether of them twain did the will of his father, they say unto him, the first. Right? The first was the one that actually ended up going and working in the vineyard. Now this is where Jesus ties it all together. So the example that he gives is actually turning from sin or turning from good to doing wrong. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And look at this. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. So if that's not Jesus putting a nail in the coffin on what John the Baptist was preaching and what repentance means. This is Jesus using an example of somebody returning from sin, the two sons, and then saying, hey, that parable is to explain to you that you guys didn't repent from your dead works like the publicans and harlots did and actually believe him. Repented not afterward that you might believe him. Believe what? Believe the message that John the Baptist was preaching, which was the baptism of repentance. So here's the breakdown. I think off the top of my head, I think it's 110 verses. I can't remember exactly how many verses, but if you type in your Bible, repenting, repenteth, repent, you know, all the different combinations of repent, all different types of repenting, you should come up with about 110 verses in the Bible. And this is what it looks like. This is, and this is mine. You don't have to do the study yourself, you know, so don't just take my word for it. This is me categorizing the passages into what I think are these different types of repentance. So you've got about 23 in the Old Testament, Repenting from good, you've got eight in the Old Testament because a lot of the repenting of evil in the Old Testament, a lot of the repenting in the Old Testament is God repenting, right? And he doesn't often repent from good to do evil because a lot of the time he's repenting of the evil or he's you know, talking about the evil that he's got to do to them. And there's two in the New Testament. I think I took one from Paul, you know, repenting of the letter that he wrote. And the other one was a quotation of an Old Testament passage where God repented from... Um, something that good that he was going to do or, or he was not going to repent of something good he was going to do. Number three is repentance from sin. So there's 10 Old Testament passages. So Ezekiel was one of them that we went to. And there's 23 in the New Testament that I believe are talking about repenting of sin. You know, Jesus talking about cities repenting. Jesus talking, uh, in Revelation, there's a lot about repenting from fornication and uncleanness. And then the last one, and this is the one where the fight is, Right? These 35 New Testament verses, this is where the fight is. The fight is, do these 35 verses in the New Testament, are they talking about point number three? Or is it point number four, where there is a different type of repentance in order to be saved that makes it not work salvation, and that's to repent from dead works. And like I said, this is not up for debate, really, because the Bible already defines what the baptism of repentance is. And we looked at, because people will say to you, yeah, John the Baptist preached repentance, Jesus preached repentance, Peter preached repentance, Paul preached repentance. But then when you go in the Bible and actually look at their preaching on repentance, it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, which is what we are explaining. Now, just quickly, just to finish up, I know this is a longer sermon, but hopefully you guys have been engaged for the whole time here. Just two quick objections that people will say that I want to give you some answers for just to help you uh, when you talk about this topic. Now, one is people will make a statement like this. People will say things like, but how can you believe in Jesus and there not be any change? Right? Have you ever heard people say that? How can you believe in Jesus? Now, first of all, I'm not, I'm not believing that I have to do works. So that's why there's no change in my works because that's not what I had to believe to be saved. But the thing is, you're right, if you believe something, you will change, but it's not your works that changes. See, so when people say, how can you believe in Jesus and not change? No, when I believe in Jesus, something did change. I repented from dead works, and I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It says that they think repenting of sin, is, of sin is what's required, and that's why they see, well, how can somebody believe in Jesus and there be no change? Why? Because they're expecting a turning from sin and a change in works. But if you're not expecting a change in works, you're just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, then there was a change, right? Because you can't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and your faith not change. And there will be an internal change in the sense now you have the new man, it's just whether or not you walk in the new man. So people will say things like, oh, but repentance is not just a change of mind. It's a change of mind that leads to a change in action. Yeah. You heard that? Yeah, well, you're right. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change in action. I changed my mind and I changed what I, what I, what the change of action was is I changed from believing on dead works and I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the change of mind that resulted in a change in action. Now, what they think is a change of mind results in a change of works. But no, because if a change of works is required for salvation, that is work salvation. And salvation is not of works. So I did change. I repented from dead works. I didn't change my works because that's not what is required to change to be saved. Now, the second one is this. The second one is, they'll say unbelief is a sin. This is one that Lewis brought up to me. Unbelief is a sin. So, you are, you, so they'll say this, so you are turning from sin to be saved because you've got to turn from the sin of unbelief. So I can still say turn from sin. Now what's the problem with that sort of terminology? Well, it's because, yeah, I get that unbelief is a sin and I get that sins in terms of not keeping the commandments is a sin, but when you group them all at the higher category, it's sin, you lose the distinction between grace and works. Now, if you're just going to call it all sin, then, you know, then did you know, let me tell you something here. Did you know that you receive grace by faith? But you, do you know that you also do works by faith? That's why the Bible says, you know, that we, we go from faith to faith. That's why it says some shall depart from the faith. That's why it says keep the faith. Because you also, you don't only get saved by faith, by grace through faith. You don't only receive grace through faith. You also do works by faith. Now, if I said to you, well, you're saved by faith, but what I mean by that is works, it's like, yeah, well, obviously we're, we're assuming that when we say we're saved by faith, it's the grace that you're receiving by faith, not the works you're receiving by grace. So it's the same, when we say repent of sin, most people are going to assume that the sin you're talking about is the fact that you're not keeping the commandments. Yeah. But we, we we're specific in what we say because we're saying, no, it's because it's not the fact that you're not keeping the commandments you need to turn from, it's the fact that you're not believing on Jesus Christ is what you need to turn from. So if you make this category error, and this is what Lewis and I were talking about, then you start making logical conclusions that aren't right because you're concluding at the, 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 the category rather than the subset underneath sin, which is you have sins of unbelief, right? And then you have sins of works. Now... <clears throat> Uh, that was my point. Now, there's one last one that I actually forgot to mention because it was in my notes here and I wasn't looking at my notes. But I'll just include this last one. People will say this to you. They'll say, but you don't just need to turn from sin. What do they say? You just need to be willing to turn from sin. Right? Oh, man. The, the amount of time... Cause, because the people that acknowledge that turning from sin is works know that you can't just do keep the commandments to be safe. So they say, it's not, it's not so they say, no, but it's, you don't get it, brother. It's not, it's not that you have to turn from sin. It's just that you have to be willing to turn from sin. Now, a few points there is one, show me willing to repent of sin in the Bible. Is there any passage in the Bible that talks about repentance? Repent, show Jesus saying, you know, the time, the, you know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Be willing to repent and believe the gospel. No, it's repent and believe the gospel, and repent means to turn from sin. So that's the first thing. The first thing is, show me willing to turn from sin in the Bible. The second thing is, why, why are you including something that's not even relevant to salvation? So why, does somebody be, have to, why does somebody have to be willing to do something that has nothing to do with salvation? What do I mean by that? We believe here that baptism is not required for salvation. But it's, it's a word. If you re repent from the sin of not being baptized, you get baptized. 
Now, what if somebody said to you, well, you don't need to get baptized to be saved, but you just need to be willing to get baptized to be saved. So like, well, I thought baptism had nothing to do with salvation. No, it doesn't. No, no, it doesn't. You don't have to get baptized. You just need to be willing. Well, why do I have to be willing to do something that has nothing to do with it? Because salvation is by grace. So you see why it's, this is why people say, well, why are you so against being willing to repent of your sins? Because my, my point is, if it's by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. And the last thing is on being willing to repent of sin. You know what in inevitably happens? Is that they'll say, they'll say you just have to be willing to repent of sin. But if somebody doesn't actually repent of their sin, you know what they say? Well, that's because they weren't actually willing. Do you know? So it's like, because if, if you were really willing to repent of your sin, guess what? You would have done it. Because you know, how can you be willing to repent of sin and not repent of sin? So you see how it just goes back to if you don't actually do the work, then you can't be saved. Because if you don't do the work, you weren't willing. You just had to be willing to be saved, but if you're willing, you would do the work. right? Because if you didn't, that just shows me you weren't willing. So you may not be saved. That's how, that's how it goes. <clears throat> so what's the big deal? Why is it such a big deal? If you haven't caught the drift of it already... Here's the last verse I want to show you. Galatians 5. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, and just put in any other keeping of whatever commandment in there, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. That's why it's a big deal, because if you tell people they have to keep the commandments to be saved. They have to keep all the commandments to be saved. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. This is why it's a big deal. This is why when people say, why are you so scared of repentance? I'm not scared of repentance. You need to repent of dead works to be saved. But if you need to repent of sins to be saved, you're not saved. That's the problem. People that have to turn from their sins in order to get saved are not saved. They will die and go to hell believing that. And that's why it's a big deal. And that's why we get upset with it. So do I believe in repenting of sins? Yes. For the believer but not for the unbeliever. You know, now doing good works is a good thing. That's why it's called good works, as long as it's in the right place. You put good works before salvation in order to be saved, you're preaching heresy. But if you put good works after salvation as a reasonable service from the Christian, that's where it belongs, and that's what needs to be preached more, not this confusion of repentance of sins for salvation and all these people now getting saved because they think they changed their life. You know, oh yeah, I did believe in Jesus before, but it wasn't until I was 25 that I really got saved and repented of my sins. Now I'm just wondering whether they're confused about salvation. Because salvation is easy. Salvation is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we cannot earn our way to heaven. We can't even be willing enough to earn our way to heaven. We just need to completely humble ourselves, realize we're a sinner deserving of hell, and just put our faith completely on you, the works that you did. Repent of our dead works, Lord, and, re and believe on the works of you so that we can be saved. Help us, Lord, to not get mixed up in work salvation, by misunderstanding passages on repentance. I pray, Lord, that this sermon gave clarity to your church here tonight on this topic. And I pray, Lord, that we would continue to fight for the faith and know what we believe about this topic. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for giving us the free gift. And Lord, I pray that through this love that you have shown us, that it will drive us to repent of our sins as a believer and live for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.